I'm showing you the good here, but there's also a bad and the ugly. Well, our one day is Thursday, August 1st, 2024. This is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. Sorry about all the hassles with the live stream. Hopefully, that'll catch up as the show progresses. So what are we talk about? Well, current market conditions, obviously, I'll have a tremendous amount to say about that. Your questions on trading, feel free to type them in at any point in time. Your favorite stock and crypto picks, you can go ahead and type those in now if you want. So we're going to focus on a couple things, methodology and action. I want to talk about a winner and troubled times and, and the million little things that are going to dovetail in with my discussion on these on the methodology and action. I want to talk about puts as a substitution for shorting. That's something we talked a lot about over the last uh, week or so in the Facebook group. And while we're on that, to short or not to short, and then I'm going to continue my series on a million little things. I'm going to focus mostly on the methodology this week. It this week, and uh, but I do have a couple of things I do want to cover that again dovetail in with everything else. If you're watching on YouTube, welcome. And I'm sorry about the issues with the feed. That was a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or as I'll have to sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. There's all my contact information. Feel free to hit pause if you watch a recording of this or take a screenshot, whatever you want to do. I do answer all my own emails. Email is dave at davelandry.com eventually. But I am on those other platforms too, and I'm fairly active. All right, let's talk about the mystery charts and the methodology in action. No mystery charts this week. There's not a whole lot of setups, and even more important, there's not a whole lot of setups that I really like. And you kind of look at that through the lens of the overall market. And if the market is questionable, then the setup really should knock your socks off before you take it. But the bottom line is you really want to, to see each position to its fruition. Spoiler alert, we'll get to that in just one second. But anyway, this is ULS. This was recommended a while back, back in June. And all the things I've been talking about lately about great setups, such as acceleration, persistency, et cetera, this one had it. It's also an IPO. And your first pullback at an IPO is usually a really good time to get in, second only to buy at B when that occasionally does set up. And there's lots of caveats for that. But the first pullback, great setup to trade. And you notice that, again, we had persistency and acceleration, and then a nice, fat, deep pullback. So this was the recommendation for the day. Entry of 4025, protective stop of 3525, IPT of 4525, and it was a first deep retracement. So entry was here, stop was way down here, and IPT was way up here. Now this is how it shook out, and we take partial profits, obviously, when we hit that initial profit target, or for those who don't know the methodology, we put on a full loaf, we don't scale in, but we do scale out. When the initial profit target is hit, we take off half of the shares. And as I talked about a few weeks ago, that reduce, reduces your exposure, especially like on the upside when as a stock gains price, it becomes more and more and more of your portfolio, which creates more and more volatility in your portfolio. By taking half of those shares off, that helps to dampen that volatility quite a bit. Also this hybrid money management, as I preach, sort of helps to, to solve for some of the problems with a longer term trend following, as I preach every week almost. Longer term trend following does have its problems. As you saw last week, the TFM 10% system, I think, had about a $5,000 drawdown, and then that recovered about half of that, and then gave it all back up again in the queues. And, and we'll take a brief look at that in just one minute. But anyway, uh, that was the entry, 400 and 200. And like I said, you're you're taking off shares because, for instance, in this case, the 200 shares is now at 50-something, and it started at 40-something, okay, or 40. So now you've got $1,100 more times two, so it's $2,200 more. And if you're in a 100K portfolio like this model is showing, then that's an extra 2% in this one particular stock, 2% of the entire portfolio. And every now and then you get one that really takes off and then that number can really grow. But when you're scaling out, it does help to, to mitigate that. So 
it would be four percent or five percent if we didn't have if we wouldn't have scaled out of half. But anyway, so this is how it shook out so far. The buy was here. We sold half at this level here. And in my particular case, here's my trades. I try to mimic the service best I can in my model account. I do occasionally use a little discretion and some other things. But it, and the discretion I use it would be within the normal parameters of something that I would suggest doing uh, as to improve your performance as you get better and better and better. If you're brand new to trading service, then yeah, by all means, follow it a little bit more mechanically, at least initially. And then once you get your feet wet and understand discretion, maybe start adding that layer of discretion on taking profits a little bit early. Looks like that's what I did in this particular case, but I, I noticed I have a trail stop. I'm not sure why. I might've been trying to squeeze some more out of it. And then I made a little bit less than $1,000 that I was hoping for on that. But the real money's in the second loaf, as you can see here. So the second loaf on a mark-to-market -market basis, I took the snapshot earlier today, and I think it closed somewhere around here. So the 200 remaining shares comes to a profit of 2250. So you add all that up about 3100 and a half, 3150 or so round numbers, 3152, I guess exactly. So it's better than a poke in the eye. On a 100K account, obviously $3,000 and change is over 3%. So that's a, that's a decent move for the overall account. Percentage wise on the individual position, it's pretty good too. We have our first short. I don't know if it's the first short of the year, might be. Um, I'm going to get into shorting here in just a minute to short or not to short, but I'd recommend you do ease into shorting. It's 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 something that looks, and I meant to look up the, the phrase I was looking for, but it, it looks a lot easier than it really is. It looks a lot cooler than it really is. It's a lot tougher, believe me. And there's an old adage, all shorts tend to go against you and initially go against you. And boy, I tell you, that sure does seem to be true, but we had this nice little first thrust set up after this stock made a bit of a triple top, it has a bit of that, and it's a pattern I've never really uh, traded or anything. It's something I casually notice. It's the three drives to the high, where the market probes higher, probes higher, probes higher, and then fails. I, I would not try to trade that or any other bigger picture technical analysis in and of itself, except for maybe something like a cup and handle, which also dovetails in with bow ties and first thrust and things of that nature. But anyway, so you see you have a first thrust down after this triple top or three drives to the high, whatever you want to look at it. And use just to just real just to rewind for a second, use this bigger picture technical analysis to help you kind of frame everything. Okay. But wait for a setup within that bigger picture technical analysis pattern. That kind of gives you a, a double barrel approach a, a, a bit to it, or kind of a Russian doll type approach. But anyway, this was the recommendation on 729. Uh, by the way, this date here is the date I first recommended. It might take a few days or even a week or so to trigger. But uh, people will ask me, well, Dave, you didn't update this date. It's like, no, that's because that's the date before the trigger, right? That's the date I first found the setup. So it, it, this is for my use too. So I can go back and see when I first recommended, I can back the chart out and see where it was. But anyway, first thrust down, and those are the parameters, entry of 62, protective stop of 68.50, and an IPT of 55.50. That's initial profit target where we unload half. So the entry was here, stop was up here, and the initial profit target was here. Now let's zoom in a little bit and pick it apart a little bit. And I want to talk about the possibility of using options, and then we'll get into this options a little bit more deeply in a few minutes. But you were to short 300 shares at $62 a share, that comes to almost $19,000 in margin per 100K. So you have almost 19% of your account, so to speak, allocated to this one position. And that's a little bit on the scary side, but you got to realize that you do have a stop. And so you're going to stop out at a 2% loss, which is $2,000 on 100K, obviously. So technically, your max risk is only 2K, but with a short, as you know, you have potentially unlimited risk. Now, the reason I use unlimited is 
In this case, we do use stops, okay? So if it blows through the stop, we'll get out at a little bit more damage than, than we intended. I mean, a stock like this one, a big, fairly thick established company is likely not going to double overnight. So we don't have to worry about things like that. But there is always that risk out there, especially on the short side. And I'll talk a little bit about that unlimited risk. But anyway, so I grabbed the options trades off of this. And initially I bought three options at 342. And those were the 65s when it was trading around 62. So those options were about three points in the money, thereabouts. And I paid a little premium on them, but not a tremendous amount, only 42 cents per option. And to me, that seems that seems worthwhile, okay? Because if I were to short this thing, I'd have to put up $19,000 per 100K in margin, whereas for $1,000, that my max risk mimicking the service would be three options at, again, 342. Now, I did notice that I got to thinking about it. It's like, well, wait a minute, Dave. If you have three options, how are you going to split that up? Are you going to sell two at the IPT or are you going to sell um, one? And so I decided to buy one more option at 349, as you can see it here. And that way, and, and initially, I just put in an order for a double. When, I, when I'm trading an option, nine out of 10 times, I'll put in an order for a double. And I'll show you one of those in one second. And that way for half, and that way I pay for my option position and get a free ride, so to speak, or a free roll. But you can see, here's the extra one that I put on at 349. So one thing that was kind of crazy, remember, it seems like all shorts go get you. The day after we put this on, I was like, mother, father, we had a $1,521 loss on the options. I'm sorry, on the short position, okay? Now, in the options, I didn't write down what they were because I didn't want to look at it, but the options pretty much evaporated. And that will happen. When you place an options trade, now, if you get really deep in the money, then obviously you don't expect it, but it's like when you have something that's kind of at the money or slightly in the money, and you have a position go against you like this, those options evaporate so quickly that, and, and I don't wanna create bad behavior, but when a case, let's say this thing went up to 67, 68 or whatever, hits the stop the in the underlying, I would just leave it on because by that time the options probably worth 50 cents or less or whatever. And just in case the whole world comes unglued, I have it on the books, okay? Um, one more thing to think about, and we'll get into this in a second when we get into the actual options part. But one thing to think about is, is sort of like taking your loss up front. So for me to take this position in a model account, I'd have to risk $2,000. But in my case, I'm like, you know what? Let's just buy these options. So I'm risking $1,000. And then I, I did an add-on, so risk a little bit more there. But then that's my max risk. Now, I'm making it sound a lot better than, than it might be, and we'll get to that in just one second, some of, the, some of the caveats, okay? Now, one thing I did want to show you here, this was kind of an s and G type of trade, and I bought one option at 40 cents, and I forget what strike that was. Oh, it was 60, okay. So I bought the 60 put at 40 cents, and then I flipped out half at 80 cents, okay? So I just bought two, just kind of an S&G type of trade. And I did do this across multiple accounts, but I didn't do it in a big way, just a couple of options here and there. And put in limit orders to flip out half. And those got hit today, earlier today. So now I have a free roll on that one position. So I wanted to show you this, not to encourage bad behavior, but to show you that if you wanted to kind of step in and, and gingerly get your feet wet, you can maybe go out of the money a little bit and buy some options. In this case, it didn't seem like they were ridiculously expensive. Keep in mind, and, and I know like one of you guys was a little concerned about his first option trades, and I suggested we'll go way out of the money, and they were way out of the money options. The 60s, the 55s, I think were 15 
cents each. So that's fifteen dollars a contract. Buy a couple of contracts of those if you're looking to get your feet wet. Okay, not as a not as your bread and butter, not as something you do every day. But if you can get a couple of contracts for fifteen bucks, okay, that's thirty bucks. Then you know have pizza on Friday night if you lose it all, as opposed to a ribeye. Okay, and that's what we're talking about the Facebook group. All right, let me look at the show you what's going on with the TFM ten percent system real quick, and then we'll we'll get back to the options talk. So these are the zones, and Jeff, who's here tonight, uh, before I shut down everyone, <laughs> I had to kick everybody out and start over. Um, hopefully he came back. Uh, anyway, Jeff pointed out that I'd, I'd always said that if we get below 10% from the 50-week closing high, which would be around 50-50 in the S&P 500 right now, okay, then the market could be in trouble. And if it closes below that 50-week moving average, then you probably want to think about getting out that silly little rule and it just kind of blows my mind and this system's been out for a while and knock on wood the walk forward real time testing with real dollars has actually worked out pretty cool but if you go back in time and you know there's no guarantees and and this is a free system so I'll give you your money back it doesn't work i guess i got to stop making that joke cuz people like like I'll give them something that's free and it's like <laughs> Well, you want your money back? It was free. But anyway, once it gets past 10%, the market's in trouble. As a general statement, Jeff's pointed out that he likes to get out of the way at 5%. Now, he's going to get it whipsawed a little bit more, but he's also going to get out of the way long before the market gets in real trouble. So right here at 5%, he might have looked to get out of the market. And you can see this was just a fake out, and then the trend continued higher. So that's the sell rules. I'm not going to go through them in a lot of detail. You can pick them up on YouTube or on my website, DaveLeonard.com. But the last sell signal was here. And then the buy signal, two bars of Landry Light in a close anywhere above the 10% line or within 10% of the 50-week closing high. We're going to look at that. So last buy was there. And so far, so good. It's had a pretty good run. And I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully we are in this for a long, long time. Now, just for SGs, as I've been saying quite a bit over the last couple of years, or year, I guess one year, uh, for SGs, I bought 100 shares of the Qs, and I have older presentations where I show the actual trade. 319.49, and way up here in the 500s, I was starting to look like a pretty decent position. Still looks pretty good, though. You know, it's, it's kind of like, as I often preach, when you start, let's say you're up 20,000 in position like I think this one was, and then you stop out and you only make 15,000. It's like, would you rather have $15,000 or zero? And and I know it's like we, we do all this mental math and, and I think we made uh, like five grand or whatever in NNE not that long ago. But it, if you look at the numbers at the peak, the numbers were absolutely ridiculous. Now I don't wanna to back too much into that, but there are things you can do if you have options, you can sell out and buy like an out of the money SG type of option. But anyway, you can't look at how much you lost in the end if you're profitable overall. And, and I know it's a tough part giving some up. And that's why within the core methodology and in stocks, individual issues, we are taking partial profits. And we do the same exact thing in crypto. But anyway, yeah, it's 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 a lot to give up. It's eight thousand. Well, in this case right now, it's close to eight thousand dollars you would give up if it stops out. Now, if it comes dangerously close to stopping out and then takes off again, then maybe you're looking at a twenty-five thousand dollar gain overall of open profits, and then you you would have some drawdown to that, obviously, in the end. So I'm sort of backing into something I've talked about quite a bit. All trades eventually end badly. And that's something that can really work on your psyche quite a bit until you really wrap your head around. And believe me, I still get affected quite a bit when I'm like, geez, I can't believe I just gave up that much money. But then overall, net net, I'm ahead of where I was a few weeks, a month, or years ago, then uh, you know, quit your bitch. And as I tell clients when they bitch about giving up open profits in the end, uh, you know, send me that money. Keep out 100, 200 bucks, whatever massage costs nowadays. Go get your massage, center yourself, and just completely forget about that trade. Find a happy place. I'm sorry that trade upset you. Send me the check. And in 30 years of doing this, I haven't received a check 
in the mail at least for that i have gotten tips which is nice uh, i'm not gonna uh i'm not gonna object to a tip all right let me go over put options as a substitute for shorting i found some slides uh on a position i did a while back and the reason i want to talk about this is just in case this market gets uglier you'll have some tools to possibly help make a little money on the short side but anyway back here this was adi and i don't know the exact date on this so it was a uh, 1922 1922 <laughs> 2022 and it was a sell short on this adi okay and you could see it was headed lower, had a nice little pullback. Entry was here, protective stop was up here, and the initial profit target was down here. So here's the option trade that I did on this. In this case, it looks like it was only 200 shares for the recommendation. In fact, we could back that up real quick and see what it was. Yeah, 200 shares, okay? So that means you, you have to buy two options to mimic it. And in this particular case, two options, $2,000. And the option price was 10, and I took profits at 14.50 on those. So that's not a bad trade percentage-wise, and it happened fairly quickly. So it's a $900 gain round number on that. Now this is something that I posted to Facebook way back then, and the answer is always tricky. So to mimic the service, I bought the ADI puts, and it only had one week until expiration. And that's where options get really, really tricky. It's like, let's say you get in the options, a week goes by, nothing happens, and it goes or it goes against you, even worse, then those options are completely worthless, and now you've got to reset. So they're not as great as they sounded earlier, but they do have their uses. So in this particular case, I was 925 in the money. I paid 75 cents for fluff. Okay. And instead of putting up 60,000, in this case, 20, 32,000, because it had been 200 shares at margin, I put up, what is this, $3,000. Still a lot of money to put up, but in this particular case, because I was so deep in the money, I wasn't looking for a double. I wouldn't mind a double, but I figured uh, four and a half points, and I don't know how that equates to the profit target, but I figured that was a good gain. 40 something percent okay so on the trade which is much better than a poke in the eye and the other thing is in this case it was only one week out and and one thing with options and i'm, I'm trying to give you both sides of the coin here but one thing with options it's like oh man i have unlimited time on these options they don't expire for weeks well life comes at you pretty fast like those commercials <laughs> back in the day you know uh but life does come at you pretty pretty fast and before you know it those options are expiring but you can see as i wrote in this post i'm able to sleep at night and not have thirty thousand thirty two thousand dollars whatever the case may be in margin exposure okay i've got two thousand dollars which is about what I would be risking anyway. So the entry was here. I took profits here. I think the options were, were uh, near expiration, but they did they did go against me. Like I said earlier, you know, like all shorts seem to go against you. They went against me, and I had a seventy to eighty percent loss on those options. Well, once you lose that much that fast, and believe me, they they evaporate so fast, you really don't have time to to sell the options. At least the way I look at things. Now I know some of you are a little bit more active with these, and you're able to take the loss. But the problem with that is you're taking the loss, and then the stock implodes. Now what you do, do you get back in? You know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. I'm not that good, okay? So in a lot of cases, and this isn't really a huge move, this thing goes against me, I'm, I'm 70, 80% of that money is gone, but you leave it on the books and, and my ass got saved on expiration. Thank you, baby Jesus. Eight pounds, six ounce, baby Jesus. So the sell-off saved my butt, but it, it could have expired worthless and then you'd have to rinse and repeat. So I'm 
I'm showing you the good here, but there's also a bad and the ugly. Now, I don't mind paying a little bit for premium, and that's why I don't go super deep in the money. Some people might prefer to go deeper and deeper in the money and trade it more like an outright, like the underlying stock. But I'm somewhere in between where I'll go fairly deep. And if, if the options seem fairly cheap to me, not necessarily from an implied volatility standpoint, but just from like a charting standpoint, like this APH we talked about a few minutes ago, it really looked like it had the potential to implode. So I'm seeing options five or 10 points out the money or whatever for fairly dirt cheap. Uh, I think the 10 point out of the money options were for six or seven points out of the money, I guess today, were like $10 or, or 10 cents or 15 cents. I mean, that's a complete s and you know, pizza party type of trade or whatever. But yeah, there is a potential for rinse and repeat and my butt got saved on this one. So the bottom line is you can sleep at night if you're in options because you have a max loss. But if you have to, if you have to take the losses and reset, that could be the, the downside, okay? And in this particular case, I felt like I wanted to take this position on. I didn't want to put on a whole bunch of margin. And also, I think the trade I just showed you was from a qualified account. So you can't actually short and something like that, something like an IRA or other qualified accounts, but you can buy puts, okay? Uh, a lot of people don't know that, so let me just uh, put that out there. You can buy puts on a qualified account. You have to sign some paperwork, but it's no big deal. Paperwork's kind of weird. It's like, Dash, how many years? If you don't have experience trading options, you can't trade options, but how do you get experience unless you lie on your form? <laughs> now, I'm not encouraging you to go out there and lie, but I don't know, I, you know, somebody explained how could you trade options if part of the rec is that you know how can you start trading options as part of your whatever the paperwork is that you have to have experience so i don't know how that works now remember that direction is hard enough in and of itself to get right okay let alone the timing and in some cases volatility so in order to profits profit on options you have to get the direction correct you have to get it has to happen within a, a, a uh, a certain period of time, and in some cases, the volatility. If you're if you're buying when the volatility is high and it dries up, the options could could really shrink in value. And then that's it's one of the not to get too far sidetracked. Imagine that, but that is one of the advantages of sometimes these S and G options, like that that option went from 40 cents to 80 cents in one day, is that it can happen really fast with those options. A little bit slower the deeper the money, the deeper in the money because it behaves more like the underlying stock. And options speak that would be mean a delta of 100. But anyway, as I said a thousand times, I spent 14 years working with the hedge fund as their technical analysts. And I would, he would ask me where the market's headed. And I told him up, down, or sideways, whatever. But, you know, let's say I was bullish. I was, okay, it's headed higher. So, okay, well, how high is it going to go? I'm like, I don't know, five points. He's like, all right, well, how long is it going to take to get there? I'm like, I don't know. It's going up, you know, uptrend, downtrend, sideways. So it can be uh, tough. Uh, again, in qualified accounts, it might be your only choice to play the downside. Uh, margin savings can be substantial, but you could still end up with a sizable loss, as I just showed. Uh, one position, I think I had what two or three thousand dollars on, and and it, these things can evaporate real quick. So it's it, they're not as great as they sound sometimes. Now shorting is a pain in the butt, tops, but when the world comes unglued, it, it it's it can be really cool. I'm I'm not sure where I was going with this. This is from an older presentation, but a lot of times it's. A lot of times what will happen, sort of like that APH, that's sort of a poster child for what happens on the short side. It's like you get short, they go straight back up. In this case, thank God it didn't knock us out, but like it'll knock you out and then the market will implode. And those are the cases where sometimes the options can work out. Like I said, you keep them on the books. I'm not throwing caution to the wind. It's just the way it works out. If you're trying to position trade, these options can evaporate really, really quickly. Um, as I said earlier, like somebody in the group was looking to get their feet wet, a little nervous about just jumping into options 
uh, both feet head first, and, and I fully agree, okay? But in this particular case, we were looking at some options that were like 15, 15 cents a contract, which would mean $15 if you bought one contract because it's 100 shares, right? That's how the stock options are priced per 100 shares. In futures, it might be one contract, and, and then it goes on how much that contract moves per point. But anyway, again, sometimes you could just buy the the OTM options, and and that's a good way to kind of again get your your feet wet. Now, in some cases, you could roll down, and this in this particular case, I rolled down because I was uh, weighing the money on one, and I rolled out. And knock on wood, this actually worked. I think that was on expiration day, so I was able to pick up a little bit more. But again, you start rolling down and doing all these other things. And it could get really tricky really, really fast. Okay, Jeff says, I use Zebra, zero extrinsic back ratio spreads for shorting. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll have to have, we'll have to, I, I know I mentioned it, we'll have to get together and have an options webinar so I can wrap my head around it. Um, I try to keep it simple. I do some spreads every now and then. I, I like the ratio spreads where I'm long the inside, I'm sorry, short the inside, long the outside. It gets tricky fast, doesn't it? And and I try, I, I do that in a zero DTE options. I'm not bragging on it because I've, I've had it that's super successful with that. Um, I see a question coming up on, on YouTube on zero DTE, so we'll get to that next. Anyway, so zero extrinsic back ratio spreads for shorting. You buy two in the money puts. Okay, so one at the money or just out the money puts to remove the extrinsic value. So the trade moves one to one with the underlying price. The sole put then acts as your IPT. Well, that's that's kind of interesting. I'll have to wrap my head around that. So you're, you're end up, you end up long one option total. Your net net is long one option. Um, that's, you know, when I first saw a complex spreading strategy, I was like, oh gosh, you know, um, I'm going to say too many moving parts, but that that could work. It does have a few moving parts, and and I find whenever I'm short an option, even if I have long options covering it, it just drives me nuts to watch that that short option go up and up and up and up. Even though I'm making money over here, it just drives me crazy. I just want to cover that option. So I don't know if covered that option, and maybe you could help flesh this out a little bit, uh, Jeff, especially if we get together for a, a webinar. But um, if you cover that short option, does it muck up the position? And I guess as long as the market keeps on keeping on, you're fine. But if the market reverses, then you you cover that option and, and, and you lost the it coming off. So yeah, options get really complex really fast. Okay, William says, hi Dave, do you trade SPX zero DT options? Yeah, I trade XSP sometimes. Uh, XSPs are they usually they they're often overpriced, and I haven't traded a lot lately. Every now and then, you could you could for S and Gs buy some out of the money options that are just dirt cheap, and I don't know why they're so cheap. Usually, usually when I buy an out of the money option, it's dirt cheap. I'm like, why would this be so cheap? I find out it, the market never goes there. But every now and then, with the with the XSP, you could buy some out of the money options. The reason I like the XSP is they're cash settled. So you could do some wild and crazy stuff. And, and lately they've been too expensive, believe me. But sometimes, let's say late in the day, you've got a big, just feels like a big rally's coming on. You could buy some out of the money options. And I'm talking late, I'm talking like really late in the day, like five minutes before the close, 10 minutes before the close. And you know you're probably gonna lose on them, but you could nickel and dime it a little bit to where, let's say you could buy options at five cents or whatever. And then you immediately put in an order to flip them out at 10. You get a little bit of a spike and you get a free position. And sometimes that free position will go in the money. Other times, it, it all depends on the market. It's really complex. But every now and then, you'll have some out-of-the-money options that are pretty cheap. And you can get levered up nicely. I've had options at a few cents. I forget the exact ones. Go like a buck or two in the money. And that, that doesn't happen that often, believe me. Um and I haven't been tracking it well lately. It's kind of like, you know, put my head in the sand a little. Uh, but I, I don't think I'm printing money in the XSP. And then lately, I really haven't made many trades there because, again, it's been too expensive. And the market's gotten choppy. So 
not only are they too expensive, but the market's choppy and you're not getting the movement that you want. So the question is, um, claiming to make hundreds of percent in these zero, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the, the question is, is a lot of people claiming to make hundreds of percent. It's like, yeah, I, I, I made hundreds of percent, okay? But to do that consistently, I don't think so. So uh, I'd be a little skeptical. It's it's like these all these people telling you how great they are. I mean, that's the first thing you need to do. If somebody's telling you how great they are, and they talk, they don't talk about how they f up and how they're emotional, like like all of us, because we're all emotional. Then you need to take it with a grain of salt. So yeah, don't don't let the um don't let that goad you into a trade or anything. But yeah, I like uh, I like what you're saying there, Jeff. And and I, I didn't get the chat logs from last week. I need to do that last week. We'll talk about options again. If it goes against you, sometimes roll up to get more premium on the short option. Oh, okay. So yeah, that now see that kind of makes sense. So what he's saying is, if it goes against you, the short option becomes worthless. So you can cover that and you can reshort. But again, you know, you get you're getting more and more moving parts and all kinds of stuffs happening. Um, like I said last week or week before, a lot of times these more complex option strategies or for the engineer type who like to kind of tinkle tinker and noodle with things a little bit to to set things up a certain way and i think one of you guys i don't know if it was you jeff or someone else was talking about their option strategies and, and that does make sense i for the most part i try to go long options if they're super expensive and i want to be long or whatever i will do the ratio spreads like i said earlier by the inside I keep getting that mixed mixed up. Short the inside and buy two times the outside when it sets up properly. And sometimes you can get like three to one off and four to one off, depending on the time of day. And you know, one thing I forgot to say about options is if you know options, you probably think I'm an idiot for what I'm saying about options because we'll probably disagree. If you don't know options, then I'm probably just confusing you. <laughs> so I use a strategy when the, the stock is high dollar also. Okay, that's a that's a that's an interesting thing. I, I I could probably learn something here. Okay. Harry is in all caps, so I guess I need to when I read it, I need to holler, right? <laughs> you could buy a put closer to the market and sell two put options further out lower. See, I don't like that. Okay. So he's saying buy a put close to the market and then sell two further out. So now you've got two times the exposure on the outside. Well, black swan events could still happen. So I'd be really careful with that. And trust me, I've had some bad experience with that in the past. That's why I'm no longer with, a, with a, an options uh, hedge fund, but that's a two drink minimum on that. You can profit if it drops more than expected, works limited to a butterfly spread in the end. You're actually just selling a short put. Yeah, see, that's where it comes, that's where it becomes really complex. And you, you, you touched upon something really important there too. That's what's called a synthetic. When you're doing all these different option things, a lot of times you boil it all down and it behaves like a certain other option, like a synthetic put or whatever. So it gets really complex. And then, like I said last week or week before, something as simple as selling options on your long position, cover calls, for instance, can get really complex really fast. And that's like one of the first strategies to let people do which is ridiculous. All right, lately we've been talking a lot about a million little things in no particular order. And we have a couple tonight that dovetail in with uh, current conditions. Number 105, 286, see each position to its fruition. And a while back I struck a card with someone. They were asking me a lot of questions about getting out when a position's not working. In other words, like a dead money position and time stops and all these other different things. And I said, just kind of randomly, random thought was like, well, if you're in for a penny, in for a pound, and that seemed to strike a chord with him. So think about it as you get into a position and you're gonna see it to its fruition. And by the way, as I said each week, everyone thinks like some big epiphany is gonna happen. Also, da, 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 you're a trader. Well, the reality it is, the reality is it's a million little things, a million little details. And a lot of these things I'm just each day I'm like, oh, I didn't check the spreads. I mean, that that probably could be one. Um, I got into one a few days ago. It had like a, a one and a half point spread or something stupid. And after I clicked into it, it's like as I was hitting the click 
to buy it, I'm like, holy crap, it's got like a one and a half point spread. Luckily, I got an okay film and the market didn't took off. It was a, it was an ogre. I don't know if I mentioned this one. It wasn't AX that I mentioned in Facebook because that one really had a horrible spread. So I learned my lesson, but it was one, um, I forget which one it was. And I'll, I'll go in and find that trade and we could talk about the yoga on that, meaning the opening gap reversal. Now, keep in mind, there's, there's virtually always a reason to exit a position and rarely a reason to stay. And it's really hard, especially if you're making the mistake, and, and I'm guilty, okay, of watching a screen too much and you're watching these things zig and zag and, and go against you. So right here, this was the ULS, which currently is our biggest winner in the portfolio, but it had it was dead money for a while. Now, dead money is is a position that has little or no chance of any further appreciation, according to investopedia.com. Well, if you do, it wasn't gonna work, then get out, okay? But you don't know that. And it's always kind of shocking to me. It's kind of like this ULS, but it wasn't moving. I'm like, you know, this thing what do they do? It's like when I find myself looking into the company a little bit more and trying to figure out if there's a reason why this stock could possibly move, what's the excitement, that confusing the issue with, with facts thing that I often talk about. When I find myself doing that, it's like I just got to just close my eyes and let it go. And believe me, when I got in this one, I thought it had tremendous potential. But when it started going sideways, I began to doubt, I began to doubt the position. And then it took forever to hit the IPT, started going sideways again. And once again, I started thinking about it. I was like, is this thing going to work or not? And luckily, it did. So my belief is don't use time stops and don't get out of position just because it's not working. If you're in for a penny, in for a pound, you got into it. Everything looked a certain way. And believe me, as soon as you step into a trade, the whole, everything begins to change. So everything's static when you go into it. You're stepping into the unknown, which creates a lot of psychological and neurological issues because we can't handle change. I think, who was it um, that says, I think it was in one of those, those little books on, which I, I have mixed feelings about those little books and, and we could get into that at some point too. I'll, I'll dig out mine. Um, I may have given them away, I don't know, but they did make a good point that uh, stress is high at its highest when information is changing or unknown. And that's the moment you step into a market. When you're when I'm doing my nightly analysis, everything's static, nothing's moving. I can check things out. And it's like, okay, I like this stock because of A, B, C, persistency, acceleration, all those other things, and things of that nature. <laughs> then I'll take, I'd say, okay, I'm gonna take this position. But then tomorrow triggers in all kinds of it's kind of like the, the shit hits a fan after that it seems like like the adi trade or was it ADI, yeah, aph trade it's like i'm like gosh darn it <laughs> that's exactly what i said this thing just went crazily against me it's like well their options they evaporated i was able to sleep last night no one only had 1300 dollars or whatever it was at risk maybe a little bit more because more than one count but you get the idea right Anyway, so this uh, finally did take off nicely and knock on wood so far, so good. Even with today's slide, it's still moving. Thank goodness. So I'm not dead yet. I feel fine. I think I'll go for a walk. That's one of the, you know, last week I was talking about, last week at Bandcamp, I was talking about movies when you rewatch them, they're not funny. Holy grail. It's still funny, but I think you have to, you need a little bit of a warp sense of humor to get it. Number 77,878, learn how to short, but don't go crazy. So to short or not to short. I pulled this from Trading Full Circle. Shorting is more difficult than it looks. I remember when I first learned you could make money when stocks go down probably in the 80s, I guess. I'm like, man, this is great because all my stocks are going down anyway. And I quickly learned that it was more, it was a lot more difficult than it looked. And it's tougher to ride the trends longer term due to the sharp retrace rally. So even if you catch the mother of all trends on the short side, especially like if you catch a transitional pattern, like maybe APH is, is done. I don't know. That might be a nice little transitional pattern. 
But even if we do profit from that position, it's going to be some big old zigs and zags along the way and likely knock us out on the way down. Much harder to ride the short side than it is a long side. Now, obviously, there's 100% max profit, and that's SANS trading around the position. Now, that add-on options trade, that might have been trading around the position a little bit because it rallied up and it was set up again. It looked like it was ready to go back down. So I put on a little S&G position just to see if I could I could get a free option position out of that. There's obviously the potential for limited losses, and that's for the stupid people, the obstinate, or the obstinate with unlimited cash. Now, assuming you don't have a huge gap overnight and you really are hurting pup, it just starts going against you. It starts going up and up and up and up, and you're too, I don't know if recalcitrant is a word, stubborn, I guess, would be a simpler word to use. You're too stubborn to get out of the position. Well, your broker's gonna call you up and ask you for more money and more money and more money. You're gonna have to keep putting more and more money up, and that's why You'd never want to answer a margin call. Just get out. There's some logistics. It has to be borrowed. You have to borrow it from somebody. And technically, they could call it back. And I've had stocks call back before that I was short. So you have a position. It's 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 doing great. And all of a sudden, it gets pulled out of your account. And they cash you out. That's kind of a kind of a weird situation to be in. But when that happens, a lot of times, especially if it's going the right direction, you can just simply buy some options. Simply. <laughs> so I'm talking about all the downside of shorting. Like, why would you short? Well, obviously, it's the only way to make money in down markets. But the main reason is that it helps you to see both sides of the market. And as I said a, a million times, my friends who run millions and millions and millions and millions, and hundreds of millions of dollars, who are long only oriented, they tend to be a little bit more glass half full when it comes to the markets. So if you short and you learn how to short, don't go crazy with it again, but if you learn how to short and you make a little money here and there, it, you begin to see the patterns unfold and it it might temper your bullishness. You might pull in your horns a little bit when the market is behaving is not behaving well, when it's starting to look like it's headed lower because you're getting a short set up. So I think shorting overall is a good thing to do. Pick your spots very carefully and and do it infrequently unless the market really presents the opportunities. And sands are rip roaring bear market you don't want to do a lot of shorting but right now as we're kind of getting a little iffy i think it's okay to put on a short or two here and there because if you catch a transition like the semis just got creamed right the old leaders are becoming the laggards okay when when i go to the gym and everybody in the gym is asking me about nvidia i know that the man on the street has discovered nvidia and who's left to buy okay that's a whole nother conversation maybe we could make that another one uh, use the man on the street as a microcosm use yourself as a microcosm with with your feelings in the market all right any questions on any of that well if not we'll go ahead and shift gears we'll hop into crypto first and then we'll take a look at stocks and if you guys have any stocks you want me to take a look at start punching them in now i uh, doubt there'll be anything in crypto to look at but We'll give it a shot. So Bitcoin got whacked pretty hard today. And uh, a little while ago, it was down really hard. But it looks like it's bouncing back a little bit. That's, I don't want to look too much at the micro. But you can see that we did come back after it tailed lower. It tailed below the 30 EMA. Came back nicely. It's wide and loose. For me to get excited about Bitcoin, it would actually have to make all-time highs. Okay. I do have a little bit hot old in a hardware wallet, uh, not enough to bop me over the head. And, and <laughs> I'd have to find, you know, you bop me over the head, but then I'd, I'd have to find a wallet. And it's, it's, it's not worth it. So don't come bop me over the head, please. Bitcoin, I'd stay away from Bitcoin for now. Let's take a look at Ethereum. Ethereum has been underperforming Bitcoin, which hasn't performed that well, you can see. It's uh, tailing off tonight. I'm glad these cryptos are coming back, though. And Ethereum versus Bitcoin is definitely in a downtrend. That looks like a, a, a decent looking short right there. 
So that's kind of interesting. One thing that's been a little cool uh, last few days notwithstanding is my hope with Bitcoin years ago would be that it would have a negative correlation to stocks. So if the stock market's selling off, maybe Bitcoin would still be going up or, or just do the opposite of stocks. Then I could buy Bitcoin and maybe make a little money while I'm biding my time, you know, maybe shorting a little bit in stocks, but biding my time waiting for some juicy longs to set up. Now, when the crypto is blowing and going, and, and one thing you could do is just keep an eye on Bitcoin, okay? If Bitcoin's under, it's not doing well, then you probably don't want to go after the SHYT shitcoins. But just for S and Gs, let's take a look at a few of these and then uh, let me know if there's any of these uh, you want to take a look at. This looks like it's trying to bottom out. I wouldn't rush out and buy it just yet. Um, as I've said quite a bit, when these things are flying, that looks okay. Popcat, I don't know if you could buy this anywhere. Uh, but that's kind of interesting. You got a nice little pullback there. Super volatile, obviously. And let's see. Let's see, that's banging out some new highs, but it does have a lot of overhead supply. But sometimes, as I've said quite a bit, when, when the markets are really running, when Bitcoin's big at all-time highs, and these uh, shit coins are following suit, you could just go in and buy the strongest pairs and I'll use like a 20% IPT and go from there. That one looks okay. I mean, I'm kind of reaching, you know, I'm not really too excited about any of these right now. But as I've said lately, you've got to keep doing your homework and I've, I've kind of been a little lax, truth be told, and doing my homework as of late. All right, I'm not seeing anything to, I'm not gleaming anything from Bitcoin, so, let me take a look. Okay, TAP, is that a crypto or is that a stock? TAP USDT. Okay, if you're looking at this, uh, as I often say, take a look at your 30 EMA. Don't buy any market that's below the 30 EMA. And you can see it's been below the 30 EMA since let's just say this day here. So yeah, it's lost, uh, I can't even count that many zeros. It's lost 90% of its value. Okay, a stock. All right, I was, I was gonna beat you up, William, <laughs> for recommending that. But yeah, just uh, don't buy any market as a general statement that's below the 30 EMA and that in and of itself will keep you a lot of trouble. Okay, I'm gonna hop into stocks and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a, a brief market analysis. And then after that, uh, we'll start looking at your stock picks. So just let me know what uh, stock picks you have. Stock beer. Yeah, I could use a beer right now. Throat's kind of dry. I try not to drink during the week, but I usually have a, a beer after the week in charge. All right, let's take a look at the P's. S&P 500. And you know what? Let me throw some uh, some bow ties in here. And we'll get back to the major mix. <laughs> Yeah, some of you guys are cruel. You'll pop a beer. You're like, I just popped a beer. I'm like, oh, thank you. I guess I could pop a beer doing these things. I'm a grown ass man. <laughs> uh, the problem when you get old, you're like, uh, once I get old, I can do whatever I want. It's like, oh, I got to work tomorrow. I can't stay up late. I can't, I can't drink beer tonight. All right, SP 500. Boy, what an ugly day. Outside day down. Let's take a look at spiders real quick so we get a true picture. But the cash looks pretty much the same. Outside day down, close below that 50. The P's are just below the 50 simple moving average. You notice that, you probably notice that I don't use the 50 a lot until the market starts getting a little iffy. Like a lot of things with technical analysis, they don't matter until they matter. In this particular case, the 50 is kind of well watched, so it does pay to pay attention. I wouldn't exit a market just because it's below the 50. But you might want to think about an exit plan. So don't sell the form, but possibly you might want to have it appraised. But yeah, outside day down, this was an ugly day. It did bounce off its worst levels. Let's see what tomorrow brings. It, it always amazes me. You have this one big up day and then the market goes straight back down the next. All right, uh, take a look at uh, NASDAQ. Ugh. NASDAQ's looking kind of ugly in here, down two and a third. 
percent. That's a big fat outside day down. We're on the cusp of a bow tie to the downside. The 10 is less than the 20, but the 20 is not less than the 30 yet. So it's almost a bow tie to the downside. It's not the end of the world when that occurs, but if you pay attention to proper order, and we could talk about, I'll put some charts up with proper order. Maybe I'll tweet out a couple tomorrow. But proper order can help to keep you on the right side of the market. Notice we had uptrend proper order, 10 grade and 20 grade and 30 for a long, long, long time. We had this little spill back here where you did have downtrend proper order, but by the time they crossed over, the market had already begun to rally back up, and then you had uptrend proper order. But now you're going to have downtrend proper order again. So as I think I said last week, the proper order of the moving averages will flip to downtrend proper order. Let me rerun it. Let me rewind it. Boop. Every bear market will have the moving averages flip to downtrend proper order, but every time they flip to downtrend proper order, you won't have necessarily have a bear market. So like right here, a little bit of a scary spill, but then the market went right back up. Right now, a little bit of a scary spill. Let's see if it goes back up. William says, lots of earnings today. Maybe people are hedging. I don't think the public is that complex uh, or smart. I don't know. Um, I'm not a big fan of hedging, um, but maybe maybe some selling on the, on the rumors. Oh, by the way, that's one thing I wanted to mention. ULS is um, was earnings that pushed it higher, and people always ask me. I'm like, I ignore all the news. I'm like, well, what about earnings? Like, well, that's news, so I ignore it. And if you want to make any money in this business, you're going to have to hold through some earnings. And I know it sucks sometimes, really bad, but sometimes it happens in your favor and surprises tend to happen in the direction of the trend, but we all know shit happens. So the rusty, it actually still looks okay with some caveats. Okay. So we got really whacked today down three and a quarter percent. As you know, forever, it's kind of sick of looking at the rusty, just chop it back and forth, chop it back and forth. Then it really took off and it rallied nicely on this pullback, but it's a bit of a disappointment. So you have, what's what I call a double top knockout. You have like a minor double top, you have a knockout move. So that's that's bullish as I told my my service peeps tonight, my premium clients, so to speak. It's bullish if it triggers. It It's not bullish unless it triggers, okay? So if the Rusty takes out this high, it could be off to the races. If it doesn't, then leave it alone, okay? And that's the one. That's another thing I wanted to talk about too. I'll make a note for next week. We had a stock in the Landry list absolutely implode. Okay, it wasn't an official recommendation, thank God. And number two, thank God again, it wouldn't have triggered anyway. So waiting for an entry can keep you out of a lot of trouble. All right, let me wrap this up fairly quickly here. So that's the that's the rusty major drugs actually made new highs today. We'll punch that in real quick. So major major drugs, PPH, banged out new highs with a bit of vigor. So maybe we'll see some setups here soon. I'm glad to see some setups other than the financials and healthcare and, and all and um, defense making new highs. Speaking of healthcare, healthcare has recently banged out new highs. So far, it's just pulling back a little bit. That still looks pretty good. As I've been saying quite a bit, we have this massive sector rotation going on. If you take a look at something like the mags, you can see it has begun to implode in here. It's pulled back. It's almost a bow tie to the downside, but it's also a first thrust. So this is a bearish pattern, okay? And, unless, of course, it goes straight back up and makes new highs and all bets are off. But that's looking kind of bearish. And the good news is you have some areas like the banks have re recently taken off. Now, banks today made a TKO. So this is a little bit of concern that these new leaders are already getting hit fairly hard this is bullish again if it takes out this high around 43 or so that would certainly be a good thing insurance has also been doing really well as of late and you can see today made it outside day down not the end of the world so far still 
in an uptrend. Regional banks are looking pretty good today, notwithstanding. This is a knockout move. The beauty of a trend knockout, when you have this knockout bar like this, and it's a big, fat, wide range, and it closes on its ass, if it takes out the high of that bar, you might have a bona fide trend reversal back into the uptrend, back into the major trend, okay? If it does not, then no capital gets put into harm's way. So that's uh, what I often call the textbook TKO, where you have a super strong trend and you've got this big old fat wide range bar and it closes on its ass. Now, for the more advanced, the other cool thing to do, and I know you want to party with me, maybe you, want, you might want to party with me after this one, is keep an eye out for opening gap reversals. So sometimes the market will get a big knockout move. You get this follow through rush to sell on the open. It knocks the market down even further, and then it's like a, a pushing a ball into water goes straight back up. Not all the time, though, obviously. Semiconductors, these are the old leaders, unfortunately, have bow tied to the downside. That trigger would have been, let's see, would have been, uh, this would have been a slight trigger. This would have been a major trigger, okay? Would I just say all shorts go against you? So what did it do? Go straight back up. As Linda Rasky once said, and I asked her about it, and she said um, it's probably a florism or something she picked up. She had said two things. The market will often, will often do the obvious in the most unobvious manner. If it's going up, it'll have a big knockout move, kind of like the TKO first. If it's going down like this, it'll have a big old rally and then go down, okay? So the market will often do the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner. And the other thing, which is the corollary, she also said in the same presentation, is that markets will do what they have to do to frustrate the most amount of people. And probably the NVIDIA thing kind of sucked a lot of people in, I would imagine. Let's take a look at that real quick. Oops. Okay, and spit them out. No, NVIDIA is not as ugly as I thought it would be, but it's pretty ugly, okay? A lot of Johnny Johnny come lately's in here, and if, as this thing drops, you're going to have more and more unhappy campers. That overhead supply is going to get worse and worse. Now, the good news, or or some glimmer of good news, is bonds beginning to take off a little bit in here, kind of wide and loose and all over the place. But as you know, bonds up, rates down, so that's a good thing that the 30-year is taken off or 20 year plus, whatever they call this. I call this a 30 year, but you get the idea. Telecom, kind of a weird funky day there. Open a gap reversal to brand new highs, but then stalling out. So let's just uh, keep an eye on that. Let's see what happens. Financials I mentioned earlier, kind of double top knockouty looking. I wouldn't call them down and out just yet, but if they pull back to where they broke out from, you would want to avoid them. Utilities, look at that. Utilities are starting to act like, as I told my peeps tonight, and I've been telling them lately, utilities are starting to act like momentum stocks, which would be cool with me. I know value becomes momentum, momentum becomes value. John Lewis um, did a nice little speech on that, as I talk about often. And so this could be value becoming momentum, but there's a little bit of a twist here. Not to confuse the issue with fact, but facts, but maybe the reason they're acting more like momentum stocks is there's there's some excitement about AI and all these all this technology that's sucking up all this power. So power is going to become a commodity. So it might start trading more like a uh, commodity and could be more and more speculative. All right, let's take a look at uh, any stocks you guys just want to look at. I know most everybody here would go to webinars probably in my Facebook group. So we occasionally talk about stocks here. Uh, let's see, TAP. Oh, okay, that's a beer. Okay, no way. No, okay. Well, the first thing that jumps out at me is it's in a pretty serious downtrend. Also, take a look at the HV. The HV is only 19. Where's the spiders? 15, maybe a little more. No, spiders are only 12, but I like to find stocks as a general statement with an HV, maybe 30 of higher. Given the market conditions, okay, right now that's about where I am. When I'm doing my scans, once I hit 30, I start going really, really fast through my charts because I know I'm not going to really be that interested in anything with an HV below 30, but I go really, really quick, quicker than I normally do. 
and then when I get down to the low twenties, I'm I'm pretty much out because usually I won't find anything that I want at that level. So this has been in a downtrend. Um, if this was I mean, technically it's coming up a multi-year lows, but for me to get excited about a stock like this, I'd like to see like 10-year lows or major, major, major lows and then have a bow tie to the upside. You've got a little bit of a, of a transition in the works, but it's already lost some steam and it's on the cusp of dropping below that 30, like I just said. So I would avoid that and find something with a, with a little bit higher volatility. Okay, any more? Got a quiet bunch tonight. It takes YouTube a second to catch up, so I'll give you guys a second over there. And by the way, thanks for thanks for um, joining me on YouTube tonight from my YouTube peeps. I know we had some trouble getting the, sh the show up and running. I appreciate that. Um, we normally do this um, simulcast thing is a pain in the butt. Okay, going once, going twice. Well, obviously, I want to thank everybody for attending tonight. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered, shoot me an email, daviddavelander.com. If you're in Facebook in the group, just bring it up in the group. I'll be happy to uh, talk to you there about it. Everybody in the Facebook group, see you tomorrow. Everybody else, have a fantastic weekend, and I hope to see you again next Thursday. Also, may the trend be with you. Thank you so much.